If you are experiencing an issue in an LSA classroom, please call our technical assistance group at 734-615-0100 using Prompt 1. Our technicians will be on campus this fall to assist with any technical issues and to fulfill any training needs with the classroom equipment. When the technician arrives at the room, they will require six feet of space around the installed equipment to maintain social distance. Do you have questions about the format or what information you should include? Your business office can help with that. Submit your drafts earlier than later so you have enough time to get the assistance and review you need. Don't wait until the last minute. Time is of the essence. Don't wait until the day before your due date to submit your documents to the business office. Here is why. The university has an earlier deadline than the sponsor because you need to factor in time for review and changes, and there is an approval process required by the university that needs to take place before your proposal is submitted to the sponsor. The process consists of approvals from the PI, the department, the college, and lastly, ORSP. ORSP? Office of Research and Sponsored Projects. What do they do? They review your full proposal for compliance with all sponsor guidelines and provide guidance on feedback from the sponsor. They also review and negotiate award contracts. This process could be very quick or it could take longer. We also need to factor in time in case the proposal is returned for changes. Submitting your proposal in the final hour minimizes your chances of receiving a thorough review and receiving the support you need to make your proposal a success. Give yourself plenty of time. Submit your proposal early, ask questions, and meet your deadlines. What to expect during the process? You may hear us use words and acronyms that you are unfamiliar with, and that's okay. Throughout the process, you may hear us say that we need to complete a PAF for you. What's that? A PAF is a proposal approval form. It is an electronic form that allows us to compile your proposal documents and send it around campus for the appropriate approvals. Have you ever heard the saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Sometimes, that's taken to mean that even when we plan to do good, things can go sideways. We might plan to forego dessert, but end up eating that piece of chocolate cake. Or we decided to quit smoking, but have a cigarette. Or maybe we always plan to use a condom, but end up having sex without one. These are all examples of a disconnect between our intentions and our behaviors. And it turns out that these sorts of disconnects are pretty big and pretty common. But that doesn't make them a good thing. Eating, smoking, and having unsafe sex might have felt pretty great in the moment. But if you had a plan not to do those things, you might feel guilty, angry, or frustrated with yourself. If we voluntarily set intentions and not following through on them makes us feel bad, then why do we behave in ways that don't match our plans? Well, behavior is complicated. Sometimes, situations don't leave us a lot of choice. Maybe the cake was baked by our friend's adorable kids, and their feelings would be hurt if we don't try it.
Melodramas are informed by social pressures and can express conservative or progressive values. They can also bring attention to marginalized groups that do not often find representation in mainstream culture. I want to pay particular attention to how formal elements in a scene from Call Me By Your Name create the emotions and the impact of those emotions on the audience. This scene will help us to discuss the so-called male weepy, a particular variation of melodrama that focuses on male emotion. You give the yep. audience in terms of information and when you give that information to the audience um, can control how they experience your film. Suspense is about giving the audience information and sometimes it's about giving the audience more information than a character has. So in this scene from The Orphanage, you can see that it's using both staging and lighting to reveal a potential danger to the main character that she's not aware of. With curiosity, you're doing something very different. You're withholding information from the audience, but at the same time, you're giving us some clues that there's something you're holding back. You're creating a mystery. So it could be something as simple as having just a, an off-screen noise. And I wanna see what color change, if any, has occurred. So we started with this nice lavender color. What is the color now? It's decidedly pink. So this is actually an endothermic process. I've removed heat from the system. Now, let's see by applying heat if I can bring it back to the lavender shade. So I'm going to take my heat gun and I'm going to apply heat to the system. So that cold bath was quite cold, so this again might take just a minute to stress it back into the other direction. So we've gone back more to a lavender color. If we force someone to have S equals zero instead of S star. And if you look at this graph and you think about what's going on, well, if you're at S star and I start backing you away from S star, what happens? Well, you lose the space in here, right? There's a, there's a gap now where marginal benefits are higher than marginal cost but I prohibited you from getting them, so you don't, right? Um, and as, you, as I back you all the way to S equals zero, you lose all of these things. So it's, it's this triangle here. Okay, uh, we can quibble about you know, how the valuations, there's probably an exponential in here to make sure the discounting is correct, but roughly speaking, this is the gap between these two curves. Table. And when students come in, they can sit wherever they want. The number of chairs and tables depend on the number of students in the class. If there's confusion about moving to another table, instructors should remind students to move according to the tournament guide sheet and that they should not be talking. Instructors should not answer questions about where to move or help them to work it out. After the invention of naturalistic techniques in China, artists would never again look at medieval styles as natural. 
they necessarily saw them as defunct. Now, if we could reconstruct how people looked at this painting, then we could judge better when it was made and why it looked the way it did. So, we invited experts from all over the world to debate these questions. The scholars we invited are all masters of the art of connoisseurship and highly qualified for the job. We can learn a lot from what they have to say. Um, this painting, the more I look at that, I um, sum up with one line. I feel it's a painting full of contradiction. The beginning of a so-called Liu Tang Lao uh, I suggested this morning that the painting was probably done around 1100 by someone very close to the man who wrote the long inscription at the beginning of the scroll. And um, that his friend was probably making a copy of an older painting for him, and he described it uh, on the painting. Uh, so I started out with my opinion. I still think that's the best opinion. Somebody like Li Gongwen or Wang Shan or Zhao Danyan painted this copy beautifully. It's a beautiful painting, uh, leaving aside the question of what it was. Uh, and, uh, and he did it for his friend, uh, Liu Tang Lao. Liu Tang Lao then wrote this detailed inscription identifying, documenting what this was. Ketchup的方法对他进行检测，检测完了之后，我们再进行第二步的艺术的时代分析。下面是由我来报告我做的这个论文的研究。呃，我先用五分钟的时间讲一下关于这个注释山水，我个人的一点看法。那么。呃，我认为我们现在需要做的一个工作就是呢，呃，根据我在故宫呃工作的一些经验，那么像这样子早期的绘画，呃，我们要对它的这个材质进行检测，那么这个是用绢绘制的，呃，有句在中国民间有句
and that's going to generate new insights and new kinds of analysis. So Proud tells us there's really three forms of description, uh, substance, content, right, and form. And so let's walk through a little bit of each. When we talk about substance, what we're talking about is the materials that actually constitute the object. And once you say that, you can see what a complicated thing this is that I hold in my hand. The most important thing you will learn in chemistry lab is laboratory safety. Whenever you are in the lab, you are expected to conduct yourself in an appropriate manner and adhere to all rules. Appropriate lab attire is required whenever working in the lab. If you want to wear sandals and shorts on your way to class, that's fine. Just throw a pair of pants and shoes in your bag so you can put them on when you arrive. Remember, the more skin you protect, the better. You must wear closed-toed shoes, long pants, and a shirt that covers your shoulders. We keep the temperature a bit cool in the labs to prevent you from overheating. The chemistry department is required to record and report all incidents and injuries in the labs. Doesn't matter how big or small the event, you must report it to your GSI. If you get a cut or a burn or your skin comes in contact with the chemical, report it to your GSI. If there's a chemical spill or a calamitous event like a fire or an explosion, contact your GSI immediately. If there's a fire, you should always yell FIRE so that people around you know and can move away safely. If there's an explosion, you probably already have your GSI's attention and you don't need to yell explosion. If you have a chemical spill, you can usually clean it up with a paper towel, then dispose of it in the solid waste bucket. If it's a little larger than you're comfortable with, let your GSI know and they'll assist you or will bring someone in the lab to help clean it up. And done. But where's the car? What do you mean? Well, we submitted the NVR with Seal Ride as the delegate. And we got a confirmation email with our vehicle number. What do we do now? Go to the lockbox. You want to help us out on this one? Hold on tight. The seal wide lockbox is located on the first floor of East Quad. Through the classroom access doors and down the hallway immediately to your left upon entering. Open the lockbox and... But it's locked! What do we do now? We can't get in! We need a code! You'll receive a code for the lockbox at the Blue Jean session. The Blue Jean session is a short video conferencing meeting you will attend upon completing this series that will cover the following. For the video? Here. In the lockbox, you will find a mesh packet which contains a pen, the car keys, and a vehicle logbook. Always check your reservation to make sure you have the correct date, time, and vehicle number. It is important that the forms are filled out neatly. Once you finish signing up the vehicle, you are ready to go. Wait! Make sure you take the packet with you. Wait! Before you leave, you need to make sure you have the packet and you also need to check three things. Make sure you have the key, figure out the car's location, and finally check the sheet to make sure your car has enough gas. We're going to be talking about the Brooker Alpha FTIR spectrometer. Don't be surprised by its small size. Even though it's only the size of a shoebox, it is the latest design for FTIR spectrometry. It's very accurate. The ATR sampling device allows us to have little or no sample preparation at all. And it costs about $20,000, so please handle it with care. If you don't clean the sample stage properly, the residue material on the sample stage and the clamp will show up in the background of your sample. Use one of the provided optical wiping tissues to clean the stage and the bottom of the clamp face. This spectrometer operates with a software package named Opus. If the Opus program is not open, double click on the Opus icon. At the Opus login prompt, leave the password blank and press login. At the About Opus prompt, press OK. Validation for the instrument will take about one minute. A box will appear in the lower right. At this point, you can click the Measure BG or Background box to start the process. If there's a spectra still on the screen, you'll need to erase it before you proceed. Insert your loaded capillary into the melting point oven, which is the three holes directly above the observation window. You can push the start-stop button, 
which will increase the temperature to your starting point. The preheat LED light will be on at this point. When the ready LED light is lit, the temperature of the oven is holding and you're ready to insert your sample capillary. Push start stop to begin ramping the temperature at the ramp rate. The melt LED will light. Now you should be observing your capillaries through the observation window. You'll want to observe the onset point, the meniscus point, and the clear point of the melting sample. During the melting process, you can press the one, two, and three buttons to acknowledge the specific portions of the melting process. A person has been exposed to a small amount of chemical, either take off the contaminated clothing and then rinse the area with running cold water, or rinse the contaminated clothing with the area exposed. Send the person exposed with another person to the chem stands in the A601 window. If you get chemicals in the mouth or up your nose, rinse out your mouth or nose immediately with large amounts of running cold water. Do not swallow. If the chemical is highly hazardous chemical, call 911 immediately. Contact chem stands either by sending a student to the A601 window or calling 34684. If a person... Navigate through the menu and select the app or game you wish to use. Hey, you getting any of this? Dude, you gotta try this on. You see a red cursor appear. Click, hold, and drag the cursor in the direction you prefer until you've reached the desired point. You can also trim the clip by navigating to the razor tool located in the toolbox or by simply pressing C. The razor tool allows you to make more precise cuts in the middle of a clip rather than dragging the clip from end to end. If you have any unwanted clips on your timeline, just select the clip and press delete. After you have all of your clips on your timeline, you can click and drag them to any position you desire. Once you are happy with your arrangement, you can choose from a list of effects and transitions that will help your project flow better. To add effects and transitions, you'll need to open the Effects panel. The Effects panel is located next to the project window. Click on Effects. This will reveal a list of folders that contain different effects that you can apply to your video. There are many effects to choose from, but for right now, we'll stick to the transition folders. Clicking the arrow beside the Video Transitions folder will reveal the different transition categories. Feel free to explore the different transitions and choose the one that works best for you. But for right now, we will keep it simple and choose a dissolve. Click and drag the transition to your timeline and hover over the end of the desired clip that you wish to add it to and release the transition. Transitions can only... In terms of um, then using WordPress, did you have, I believe, Blue Core supported, provided support to your students? Did they visit class? We had Anthony, Anthony Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. Anthony came. He came and he visited the class. Okay. He explained okay. what the what the what our choices would be. Mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. picked everything up just like that. Okay. I was about ten steps behind them. You know, it was much easier for them to really understand okay. how this was going to be set up. Mm -hmm. So yes, he talked to them, he talked them through mm -hmm. it and we made a few choices with mm -hmm. him, but I, I think I had also met with him before that, and okay. so some of the choices were already conveyed. Okay. And 
I, I can't remember the sequencing of it. Okay. Yeah. But, but it was, was fantastic to okay. work with him. Oh, yeah. yes. And, yes. and you know, and under pressure because yeah. I should have given myself more time to prepare this. Sure. Uh, but there was a lot to prepare <laughs> for the class. <laughs> so next time. <laughs> yeah. And I think also, is, I think it's really important to try to figure out how to reuse some of these so that you don't have to build the structure all over again. Yeah. You know, when yeah. I have a class, like I did this with another class, mm -hmm. and I want that, mm -hmm. that WordPress to be used Mm -hmm. again and then you can sort of build from one class to the next because uh, it's a lot of work to set it up but yeah. also students yeah. can benefit from reading what other people have read yeah. before yeah what, what would you say surprised you the most about teaching this way um, what was the biggest surprise? surprise I think I was surprised at <laughs> that I did it and pulled it off but I was surprised <laughs> at how well it went I think for me because um, I know when people have asked me, what do I like teaching? When I first arrived at Michigan, I was utility infielder and taught lots of different classes. So the response to that is anything I'm not doing for the first time. Oh, yeah. So content knowledge, very comfortable with the class, but completely changing the format and also, in my experience, knowing that needed to be justified and, and sold. I knew I was going to have to pitch it. I was amazed at how well that it came off. I did have a vocal group who didn't like it. They were like, oh, what have you done to it? But it was <laughs> small, and I had a, OK, fine. Um, you don't like it? You don't have to do it. Yeah. I'm not forcing you on anything. Yeah. But I yeah. think I was um, pleased with how well it actually went through the first time. Um, I credit a lot of my GSIs. I did have a great staff. Um, and I credit the students for their flexibility. Yeah. And I really think if you ask people to do something, you explain what you're doing, tell them what's going to go on. They rise to the occasion and they did a fantastic job. One of the silver linings of the pandemic has been that uh, we found writing and administering open book digital exams uh, was really value added for our students and open book exams actually allow for you to train students how to learn the material more deeply and more fully uh, over the course of the semester. You also give them tools uh, to use as they study in upper level courses. Open book exams are a practice that we like and will probably carry on into the future. Yeah, I was interested. I'm a fairly new faculty member mm -hmm. here on campus and so this was the first time that I was introducing a large course mm -hmm. um, on campus here and so that my initial um, contact was with CRLT and I participated in a large course initiative workshop in which we spent multiple weeks working on different concepts around pedagogy, around GSIs, and, um, assessments. Mm -hmm. So that was my initial contact, was trying to rethink the course through this um, LCI grant that I'd received. And from there, we started to open up for other opportunities and to try to think about how to do a course, which is typically a lecture course, and mm -hmm. undo it in some ways that might be interesting for students, for GSIs, and, and for me as, as the instructor. So, <laughs> it, so the course was a fall course, and the initial conversation was about middle of spring semester, uh, of um, winter term. Okay. Yeah, around the wow. middle of winter term, we started the mm -hmm. conversation. So I think Jason emailed me sometime um, in April mm. or March, actually. That's about right, yeah. yeah. March or April. And which this was just amazing. I was like, oh my God, we have an entire summer to plan. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what a luxury. And it was great because um, I could have that initial conversation with Jason at the time. I was the digital pedagogy librarian, so this was this was my job. And yeah. I was able to bring in Maura, our history librarian, and then our folks from special collections. And I think mm. we also had conversations with someone from your unit who was mm -hmm. working with clickers. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's Anthony right. Anthony King with that's iClicker right. Cloud. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we, it was really great because we could think about all of these things. Um, Special Collections had already worked with another, like I think, 80-person English course. So they were also like tweaking and refining some of their methods um, mm. so they could share also the example uh, assignments that they had built out with this other faculty okay. member. Okay. And then, then we could tweak it okay. and, you know, uh, make it appropriate for this class. Nice. And then we, we met early on in this, uh, prior to the, the start of the semester, so we could actually like fine tune the assignments, um, okay. we could schedule spaces. Um, and because Special Collections was coming in every week for four weeks with the, the recitation groups. That's right. Um, so that okay. was a lot of juggling of space and, and people and, people and materials because <laughs> okay. they were taking, you know, uh, 
primary materials from the 19th, 18th century, 18th and 19th wow. centuries, and wow. carting them all over the library wow. for the students. Wow. So there was a lot of just to coordinate. The logistics mm-hmm. were really pretty significant. <laughs> I would like today to talk about my program, The Pedagogy of Action. How do I teach students who hear every day that America is the greatest country in the world and Americans are the greatest to learn humility? It's a program I have developed and I've been working on it for like 14 years now at the University of Michigan, where I take students abroad, largely to South Africa, to teach low-literate people an HIV intervention module uh, that is completely oral and taught regardless of literacy. I don't have to do the study abroad this way. I could do it completely differently. But I do it this way because I want you to have (coughs) an impression of South Africa and a relationship with South Africa that is whole. A new sort of component of the pedagogy of action that I developed in the last three years in that is I'm using people that we taught in the community in Michigan to come back and teach university students. Power and information and knowledge should not just come from people in the university, but community people also have power and expertise. I'm very invested in teaching American students at the university. And the reason I do that is because they run the world. If we could conscientize these American students, and if we can make them feel something for us, and for us I mean in the developing world, then perhaps it would be down to our benefit at some point in time. Important discourse for us, us to have with recipients, because the recipient's voice is always absent that we think about what does the recipient feel who must extend their hands constantly for help. The students become more human and learn that the responsibility of privilege is humility and respect. And that the best way of being an American in the world is not to flaunt their gifts, but to be a gift to come home with new eyes and see their world a little differently and to challenge themselves to a, to a lifelong struggle for social justice. Then, when that happens, I feel that my work is done.